CBS presents this program in color. Good evening, my fellow Americans. I just want to take this opportunity to thank those of you who voted for me in the primaries held thus far. I'd like to thank 51 good Americans who voted for, <laughs> who voted for me in New Hampshire, two good Americans who voted for me in Wisconsin, and two more good Americans who voted for me in Pennsylvania. While I'm not disappointed by this trend, I do have a feeling that some of you are not behind me all the way. And as I've said before, while I am not disappointed by this trend, I do have the feeling that some of you are not behind me all the way. <laughs> but this is not a laughing matter. I have conducted my campaign thus far in the true American political tradition. I lied about my intention to run. I have been consistently vague on all the issues, but this apparently has not been enough. Therefore, I now promise you, my fellow Americans, that I will continue to make promises that I will be unable to fulfill. <laughs> Thank you. It's the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. With guest stars Don Knotts, Robin Shankar, Pat Paulson, Lee French, special guest star, Bill Tome, the Jimmy Joy singers, the Louis Vuitton dancers, and Nelson Riddle and his orchestra. From Television City in Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, meet the Smothers Brothers. They have no sex. <laughs> no wonder they're cross. And they're very stubborn also. And frustrated. No sex. <laughs> now that we know a little bit about the mules, let's get back to the song. There's a land full of sadness set in black around the border. There's a pair of boots for someone who made them had to order. There's a Bible in a pack for the Reverend Mr. Black. Get along, yo, get along. Ha, ha, move on, Okay, yo. Tommy, picture that mule train coming through Death Valley now. Can yeah, I got it in my mind. And the wagon train is moving, struggling and straining through one yeah. of those hot Death Valley days. Right. And who's driving it? Ron Reagan. <laughs> You're driving it. You're the mule skinner, and you're in Death Valley. The sun's beating down on your forehead. That's hey, why do they call it Death Valley? Because of Ronald Reagan. No, no. Because the sun, Tommy, the sun could wipe you out. So could Ronald Reagan. Forget Ronald Reagan. I wish I could. I just... <laughs> you're a mule skinner.
Skinner and you're driving 20 mules. Why 20 mules? Because many of them aren't gonna make it, Tom. They're gonna die. That's you gotta keep that wagon going or you're gonna die too. That's you gotta get that wagon through, I'm getting right? through. Because what's in that wagon? Dead mules. They couldn't <laughs> No! Mule train, Tommy, carries badly needed supplies for those settlers. Ah. There's some hot bread and needles for the folks away out yonder. There's a shovel for a miner who left his home to wander. There's some primitives and pills for the settlers in the hills. Don't get along, get along, mule. Get along. Get along. Ha! Ha! Okay, Tommy, concentrate now and capture the mood of the song. I'm the concentrating. Mule train. Think. I can. I see it. I see it. Wow, I see it. I concentrate. Wow, look. Woo! Run, 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 Dancer, I mean that mule driver was George Lefebvre, and I know his delicate step anywhere. That's Every right, time Tommy. just stepping around, George riding. really captured the character and the yeah. flavor of that mule skinner, didn't he? He did a great job. Yes, he did. But you know what? Something was missing. There's one thing that was missing. You know what it was? What was there it? weren't any mule sounds. You were supposed to make the sounds of the mules. Well, so I, why didn't you do it? Because huh? I don't I don't do I don't do mule sounds that well. Sure you can. No. Listen, you're world famous for your animal impressions. You know that. My gosh, you did the, the world famous frog and you did the quack quack, the ducks. I okay. do the quack. Right, do the mule. I'll do the quack 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 quack. <laughs> the mule. Do the frog. Ribbit, ribbit. <laughs> the mule. Now we just we're in a mule song, right? Are we doing a duck song? Yep. Are we doing a frog song? No, we're doing a mule song. Make. Make an effort to make the sound of the mule. You, you, you can do it. You're great. You're powerful. You can do anything. Do it. Come on. Hey ha, hey ha. How about that, ladies and gentlemen? My brother just made an ass out of himself. <laughs> Gentlemen, we really think we have a very, very exciting show for you tonight. Whoopee, we sure do. Well, I'm glad you share my enthusiasm. Well, I say a good show is a good show. That's you great, know, Tommy. With us tonight is, of course, Mr. Don Knotts and the singer-singer, Mr. Mel Torme. And we also, we also have a gentleman I'm very proud to be associated with, I'm a great sorry. artist from the Near East, direct from Israel, Rabbi Shankar. <laughs> he's not from Israel. Tommy, he's not a rabbi. He's not from Israel. He's not a rabbi. He's from India, and his name is Ravi. Ravi Shankar. You, well, oh. Yes, that's right. I, let me introduce Mel. Well, I just thought that He'll it was, sing, and then we'll talk. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it, well, okay? I, well, it'll, get, it'll get better. See the Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the fabulous Mel Torme. It was the 10th day of August, way back in 33. Roller skating around in the town where I lived Who did I happen to see? While I was close to the bank When a battered old Lincoln pulled alongside And you'll never believe who got out of that car It was Bonnie and Clyde She looked as sweet as a primrose With hair the color of sand And then I noticed the blue steel cold 
automatic she held in each hand When I saw that big double barrel shotgun he held at his side Then I knew that our bank was in for a visit from Bonnie and Clyde And while they were in there the birds didn't sing and the wind didn't blow and the world kind of held its breath And I could just picture flew open and Clyde and Bonnie backed out and they were giggling and laughing as happy as kids of that there wasn't a doubt as she got in the car she looked down at me what do you think she blew me a kiss gave me a grin winked me a wink and then they drove away Now you don't have to tell me That they were bad as can be But I will never forget How she looked when she looked down And smiled at me She was as sweet as a primrose With hair the color of sand They shot them dead in a meadow They lay there side by side And lots of people for hundreds miles around were glad to hear that they died but I know somewhere there were a pair of women who cried yes the broken hearted mothers of poor Bonnie and Clyde yeah the broken Mothers Brothers Corporation presents an SBC report, <coughs> an in-depth survey of our overcrowded hospitals. Never before has the American hospital been in a position to do more for its patients, and yet Never have there been so many complaints, so many frustrations, as the mounting influx of patients puts an ever-increasing strain on our hospital system. But just how bad is the situation? Let's have a look at one of our typical hospitals. This is Mountain View Valley Vista Hospital, and this is a typical patient. Uh, your name, sir? Your name, sir? Uh, Keppel, Ernest B. Keppel. Uh-huh, and how long have you been here at Mountain View Valley Vista? Uh, three and a half days. I see, and now you're going home. No, I'm waiting for a room. <laughs> see, I've got this terrible pain in my stomach, and I was admitted about three and a half days ago, but they can't find a room for me. You mean they've had you out here in the hall for three and a half days? Yeah! See, I've got a terrible pain right here in my... My mouth? <laughs> Yesterday she... <laughs> Mr. Keppel! <laughs> Mr. Keppel, there must be some kind of room for you in that hospital. <laughs> I hope so. If it wasn't for that peanut machine, I'd have starved to death. <laughs> And, you know, there, there's also a time, you know, like you want some Now, privacy. Now, what is that doing in your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> That's the other nurse. <laughs> Mr. Keppel, I uh, certainly think you should, you should definitely complain to somebody. Oh, no, no, I'm lucky I've got a doctor here on the staff or I wouldn't even have been admitted. I mean, my doctor's... Oh, oh here he is you now. Are Dr. Torbay. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 if it isn't my favorite patient, Mr. Watkins. <laughs> no, 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 I'm Keppel, the one with the pain in the stomach. Oh, yes, Watkins died, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Looked a lot like you, too. Hmm. Had the same pain in the stomach. Let's take a little fast check here, right? Okay. All righty. Now, say four. 
far. Okay, we got nothing to worry about here. Well, what have I got? Well, you've got Blue Cross, Blue Shield, two major medical plans. You're in great shape. Miss Fenwick, I'll be operating on Watkins here, so... Uh, no, Watkins died on Capel. <laughs> keep forgetting. Yeah. Prepare surgery room A at once. Oh, but the surgery rooms are all in use. Now, we'll get this done yet. I wonder if the kitchen's been cleaned yet. Uh, listen, you know, I think that paint is going away. I think it was a little gas, actually. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Did they fix the light in the men's room? No. Uh, listen, really, I mean, I'm, I really am beginning to feel a lot better. Heck of a lot better. I'm sure. I'm sure there's some. Some. What about the basement? Hey, that's where Watkins got his. <laughs> listen, I'm telling you the truth. I'm feeling better. Now, I'm wait a minute. You're getting this operation. No, I don't want an operation. I'm the doctor. Yeah, but you know I'm the a patient. patient. I'll tell you. Now wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Yeah. You got a bad pain in your stomach. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Folks, conditions in our hospitals are a little bit difficult, but who is responsible and what can be done to improve the situation? Well, we decided to talk to an expert in the field, and his name is Gunther McCune. He is one of this country's most eminent hospital administrators. Uh, sir? Sir? Sir, we, have, we understand you have recently completed an investigation of current hospital facilities. That's true. We've just completed a seven-year exhaustive study of this shocking situation. Uh-huh. And what do you find to be the principal cause of this overcrowding of our hospitals? Sick people. <laughs> it's depressing. You get these sickies out of the hospital and you'd be surprised how much room there'd be. <laughs> With a bowling alley in here. But, but Mr. McCune... No, not was... Mr. McCune. It's Dr. McCune. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I Owen always practiced here. I would... Two years in Tijuana. Yes, that's very impressive. Uh, but doctor, what I, what I want is uh, this problem in your hospital. Uh, is, is the problem not enough beds or is it too many patients? No, actually we have 600 beds and 600 patients. Well, then what's the problem? Well, we only have uh, 300 mattresses. <laughs> do you mean to say, do you mean to say that you have 300 patients sleeping on bare springs? I mean, what do they do? Well, they bounce a lot. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Well, doctor, in your opinion, has Medicare aggravated the present hospital situation? No question. You have this free medical care and people take advantage. They're not all that sick. Let's face it, you've got all these people over 55 and over... 65, doctor. Are they, what? I said 65. Medicare starts at age 65. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Dobson, send my mother home. <laughs> I don't care if she does have a broken leg. Let her hobble till she's 65. <laughs> we have nothing but problems here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see, Doctor. <laughs> well... <laughs> This'll do. <laughs> and it's reusable. Tell me, Doctor, what is the answer to this shortage of hospital space? Well, it's a very uh, complex thing. You can't force a doctor to release a patient, and you can't chase these people out when they don't want to go. Well, isn't there anything you could do to discourage the patients from staying in the hospital? Yes, we have our ways. <laughs> Bad food. <laughs> Ugly nurses. <laughs> and as a last resort, we keep the bed pans in the refrigerator. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McHugh. Thank you very much, Doctor. Well, apparently there is no easy cure for hospital overcrowding, and the patients will just have to learn to make the best of it, as they are doing here in Ward 203. Uh, hello, hello there. Does anyone feel like talking? Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, tell me, how long have you been in the hospital there? 
Oh, <laughs> ah, shut up. Oh, about uh, three weeks now. Pardon? Three weeks. <laughs> three weeks. Well, it sure looks crowded in there. Five beds in one room. Well, it's crowded, but you know, it's really crowded, but you, you never know. <laughs> You're not doing too well. <laughs> I see, yes, yes. But, sir, how can you stand being in a room like that? I mean... Well, it's not the... Uh, it's, not the it's not the greatest, but there's shorter space, so you got to make things, you know, take these things in stride. Well, you certainly, certainly should be admired. Yeah, well, I figure they're doing the best they can here, you so I... You want to knock it off, okay? <laughs> sums it up. It's a difficult situation. We could only advise that each and every one of you not wait till the last minute for all those hospital reservations. Be smart. Plan your sickness well ahead of time. Good night, good health, and God bless. You know, one of the most influential musicians in pop music today doesn't play the guitar, the trumpet, or the harmonica. He plays a sitar, an ancient instrument from India. His name is Ravi Shankar, and he's been a major influence in, of the music of a lot of the pop groups today, the Beatles, the Birds, Chad and Jeremy, and many, many others. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Ravi Shankar, accompanied by one of India's greatest tabla players, Ala Raka, and supported by Kamala on the tabora. Hope you listen closely, because I'm not going to repeat it again. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great honor for us to have him on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Ravi Shankar.
take a moment here to talk with Ravi. I'm moving some uh, incense. Uh, why is it that all the time up like at Monterey Pop Festival up there in Monterey, you were uh, also on stage had the incense going? Is there some reason? <clears throat> well, originally it has something to do with our religious uh, thing, but I use it mostly for the atmosphere. Yeah. Yes. Now about the, the sitar, this is just uh, being a master musician, sort of quote of India, uh, you've influenced a lot of people over here. Is the sitar uh, difficult to play as opposed to the guitar or any of the other instruments? How many strings does it have, etc.? Well, it's, uh, it has got six playing strings. Four for melody, two for rhythm. Underneath there are sympathetic strings, 13 of them. Are those the ones that vibrate while, while you're playing right, the other things? That's right. And, and you can pull the strings like, you know. Don't pull it too hard. <laughs> Let's say, uh, now the instrument that, uh, that you're playing. Tambura. Tambura. Now that's the one that uh, it's is. It's the drone instrument. It has to be set up exactly with your uh, yes. other instrument. Now you're going back to India uh, yes. soon? When? In about two weeks' time. It's a pleasure having you on this show, Thank all of you. you. Let's give him a big hand. Ravi Shankar. <laughs> Once again, it's time to Share a Little Tea with Goldie, a program for you, the woman of today, a program designed to keep you above what's happening. So won't you join us as we share a little tea with Goldie. I'd like to greet all you ladies, as I usually do. Hi. Because <laughs> once again, it's time to get above what's happening. Now, ladies. Meet our guest, Dr. Plank Woodman. But before we meet him, let me tell you just a little bit about who he is and what he's done. Dr. Woodman is the author of that best-selling book, I know you've all heard of it, Dr. Woodman's Woodman Report. <laughs> Isn't that far out? <laughs> you know, this man is the country's leading authority on sanity, <laughs> or insanity, depending on where you're at. <laughs> so let's find out where he's at. Ladies, Dr. Plank Woodman. that hep stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was funny when you were asking where I was at, I was right out there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, you really are hip. <laughs> oh, won't you share a little tea with me? <laughs> oh, doctor, it's just regular. <laughs> uh, would you like a little sugar? No, thank you. <laughs> Doctor, it's just really groovy having you on the show today and everything. And I know all the ladies at home would just really dig hearing right from you what's your book about. Well, actually, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> That's a little humor there, but seriously. <laughs> As you people would say, uh, my sack is sanity. Your sack? Yeah. That's, that's the sack I'm in. <laughs> oh, wow. You mean the bag you're in. <laughs> oh, bag, yeah. I knew that. But my book actually is a definitive statement on the sanity of the human mind. Oh, wow. You mean you've actually defined sanity? Yeah. I mean, you know what it is? It's an exact thing? Yeah, yeah. And after you read my book, you'll be able to identify crazy people right off the bat. How about that? Wow. <laughs> That's pretty far out. I mean, well, well, what do crazy people look like? They look different. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. I'm sure that's going to help so many of us. <laughs> well, tell me, Plank, 
Just how do you know? How do you know for sure that somebody's cuckoo? Well, I have developed a simple test questionnaire called Dr. Woodman's Crazy Quiz. That's a little play on words there. Wow, Dr. Woodman's Crazy Quiz? Yeah. You mean to tell me you actually have a test that can determine if I'm crazy or not? Yeah, would you like to take the test? Oh, wow, I'd love to. Okay. How far out? <laughs> I'm really going to punch it at you. <laughs> you mean sock it to me. <laughs> the first national crazy test right on television. <laughs> okay, let's get down to serious business now. Oh, wow. The first question is, are you afraid of heights? Oh, no. Man, are you kidding? I mean, that's the whole trip. I mean, that's the whole purpose, to get above what's happening. That's where it's at. <laughs> Let me see. That's very interesting. Now, the second question is, are you afraid of the dark? Oh, wow. You know what? Like, you know, when I'm traveling through the canyons of my mind, you know, really getting into myself, you know, trying to dig my hang-ups, where I'm at, you know, all the basic stuff and everything. You know, I dig these pits in my head. They're sort of dark and everything, and I usually fall into them. But then when I'm in them, I just sort of flash right out into the light, and then everything is groovy after that. You want to just answer these yes or no? <laughs> yeah, I just did. You just did? Yeah. Let's try the word association thing. Uh, <clears throat> That's groovy. Yeah, okay, now here's the way it works. Whatever I say, you just say the first thing that comes into your mind right after that, okay? Okay. Okay, here we this go. This is out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> mother. Love. Uh-huh. Baby. Love. Peanut butter. Love. <laughs> Grass. Love. <laughs> Garbage. Love. Love. Peanut butter. Sandwich. Air. Breathe. Sky. Blue. Grass. Love. Oh, wow. Oh, no, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. No. That's far out. Oh, we all uh, just communicated. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, I guess so. But now, actually, no, here's what we're doing. Let's get, uh, let's get back to the questions. Uh, what, what do you do with your leisure time? Oh, I just let it all hang out. <laughs> I see. Where, well, where is this hangout here? Oh, it's not a place. It's a, you know, it's me. It's my whole soul. It's, it's everything. You know, it's, I just expose myself as I am here and now to the universe and all the elements. I mean, don't you? Don't I what? Don't you just let it all hang out? <laughs> This guy, this guy so, uh, uh, this is my test. I ask the questions and you do the answers. Now, what you've done is you you have switched it around where you're asking me the questions and I'm doing the answers. Now that that that's not right. Just a, uh, there now you see you see what you you made me do. You you made me uh, break my pencil. And I, and I can't write down the answers to the questions, but I'll tell you something about you. You want to know something about you? Yeah. You wanna, yeah. I'm going to tell you something right now. You're crazy. <laughs> Yes, full out nut. Oh, well, thank you, doctor. Oh, but tell me, don't you really feel groovy just having to let uh, let it all hang out here? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, ladies, ladies, you know some trips are just a little trying. But they sure are worth it. <laughs> and he's a lovely man. I'll take care of him right after the show. <laughs> I really want to thank Dr. Woodman for freaking out on the show and, well, just letting it all hang out here today. <laughs> so this is Goldie O'Keefe saying, just let it all hang out. <laughs> this has been Share a Little Tea with Goldie, an irregular feature of the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. <laughs> We'll be right back with Don Knox, Mel Torme, Matt Paulson, and Lee French on the second half of the Smothers Comedy Brothers Hour.
ladies and gentlemen, an, an embarrassing situation has just developed on the show, and which Tommy and I would like to clear up right now. So before we go on with the program, let me explain. Now, there has been talk that Pat Paulson is running for president. And unfortunately, this puts us in a very difficult position, because if Pat, who is a regular on the show, were indeed a candidate for the presidency, we'd be subject to the equal time provision and would have to turn our show over to all the other comedians running for that great office. <laughs> <laughs> so we have asked Pat at this time to make a statement to those many well-meaning people out there who are urging him to throw his hat into the ring. So I'd like at this time to turn the show over to Pat Paulson. Thank you, Dick, Tom, the entire Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, and the vast affiliated stations of the Columbia Television Network, Thomas A. Dawson, President. <laughs> For allowing this opportunity, this prime time, in front of 40 million fellow Americans, to deny once again that I am a candidate for the coming election. There are so many other candidates denying their candidacy that it's hard for me to find equal time to deny mine. <laughs> to prove the honesty of my denial, in a recent presidential campaign survey, my name was not even mentioned. I feel that this is unfair. I want my name right up there alongside the other non-candidates like Governor Reagan, Governor Rockefeller, and Senator Kennedy. Why should they get all the publicity for not running? <laughs> I will not deny that I have considered the possibility of running for president. I owe that much to my public. But upon further examination, I have discovered that it cost each presidential candidate 45 to well, 35 to 40 million dollars to run a campaign. And I figured, why should I spend 35 or 40 million to get a hundred thousand dollar a year job? <laughs> However, in spite of my repeated denials, the groundswell of popular support grows every day. I do not understand why this is happening. The fact that I have a surefire plan of action to lower taxes, solve our civil rights problems, <laughs> obliterate the national debt, and put an end to the war in Vietnam obviously disqualifies me as a presidential candidate. <laughs> I say leave politics to the politicians and leave me out of it. I don't want to be any more than I am today, a common, ordinary, simple savior of America's destiny. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, one of the touching moments in American politics. Patrick Paulson's official denial of his intention to run for the President of the United States. And we could only hope, we could only hope that his plea will be heeded by the millions of people who are crying for him to be president. Thank you, Pat. Once again, Mel Cormay! Many men with lofty aims Try for lofty goals Others play at smaller games Being simpler souls I am of the latter brand All I want to do Is to find a plot of land And live there Someday We'll build a home On a hilltop high You and I Shiny and new A cottage The two can fill And we'll be pleased to be called the folks who live on the hill Yes, we may 
be adding a thing or two, wing or two. We will make changes as any family will. But we will always be called the folks who live on the hill. Our veranda will command a of meadows green, the kind of view that simply has to be seen. And when the kids grow up and leave us, we'll sit there watching the same old just we two, Darby and Joan, who used to be Jack and Jill, the folks who like being called, what they have always been called. gentlemen, tonight we are going to have some fun with hats. And to start it off, here are the Louis Dupron dancers. much to affect the character of a person or to enhance the appearance of a head as a hat. So tonight, as a treat for all you heads all over America, we're going to take off our hats to the wonderful world of hats. Now there's all kinds of hats. There's a top hat, a felt hat, a fur hat, a straw hat, a baseball cap, a ski cap, a hunter's cap, and a night cap. So here's the hats. There's a crown on my head. I love using royal margarine. <laughs> Makes me feel like a queen. Lady, look, I can't come out every time someone burns a draft car. It's really far out being this high. <laughs> There's trouble brewing out there. I better see if the coast is clear. <laughs> Went out last night. How was she? <laughs> the greatest. Congratulations. 
Her name's Helen Bixby. <laughs> I know her very well. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> She's my wife. <laughs> Didn't know she was your wife. I didn't know she was that great. <laughs> There's trouble brewing out there. I better see if the coast is clear. <laughs> Uncle Sam wants you. <laughs> Wait a minute. Not me, you hamburger. <laughs> Why'd I blow my mind last night? <laughs> I better see if the coast is clear. <laughs> That's another fine mess he's got us into, Ollie. <laughs> Peter Pan, I can fly, I can fly, I can fly. So can I, so can I, so can I. I presume. No, Dr. Spock, I don't figure they'll find me here. <laughs> Listen, I better see if the coast is clear. time, so we'd like to thank our guests for tonight, Don Knotts, Mel Tomé, and Ravi Shankar. Weren't they great? Wow. Um, Join us again next week when Tom and Dick's guests will be Carl Reiner, Jenny Smith, and The Happenings. Good night, every Good night. Thank you.